Okay, tough choice today. I was planning on talking about the other side of the coin yesterday. I was talking about how Britain is making progress and is rejecting uh, the Omicron hysteria and is starting to back off the ledge a little bit. And I, you know, I maybe went a little overboard and saying nice things about Boris, but I don't want to rip somebody when they're doing something right. Today, I was going to talk about Macron and Draghi and whoever that jerk is uh, who replaced uh, – uh, Merkel in Germany, how they're going in the exact opposite direction, and they're going, you know, full uh, uh, put the unvaxxed in prison kind of thing. But then I can't ignore what's going on in Kazakhstan. It's too, you know, this is my wheelhouse. This is the kind of stuff that I used to talk about a lot more on this channel um, back when I hardly ever talked about, you know, domestic American politics. Before the Wu flu, my bread and butter uh, was this international unrest. And this story in Kazakhstan is very interesting to me because it, it, uh, Kazakhstan is one of those legacy regimes like Belarus, uh, which uh, pretty you know it solidified pretty quickly around the end of the Soviet Union. Um, the the guys who were in charge of the of, of the Kazakh Soci so Soviet Socialist Republic at the end of the Soviet era have remained in power. Uh, for this past 30 years it's been since the fall of the Soviet Union. We just celebrated the 30th anniversary. Uh, we've got the, the Nazarbayev, who was in charge of Kazakhstan since 1989, before the end of the Soviet Union. He stayed in power this whole time, uh, just resigned today from his last official uh, government position, which was the chairman of the Security Council. Technically, you know, he, he stepped down from being the president in 2019, but, you know, he's still got a job, you know, he's still making decisions, he's still the big man uh, in Kazakhstan until today. He's out, apparently. And officially, what triggered this is a uh, lifting of price controls on fuel prices for Kazakh citizens. Is that all that this is? Probably not. <laughs> I think that that is just the trigger. Like with so many of these things, you have resentment that's built up against these regimes around the world that goes on for many, many years. And then there is some particularly offensive event that triggers uh, these mass uprisings. But, of course, there are accusations that this is just another uh, CIA-backed color revolution. Uh, an accusation that is to be expected uh, from the Kazakh government, from the Russian government. Uh, is it true? I mean, I don't know. We don't have proof yet. We don't have the documents yet. It hasn't been leaked or declassified, but the timing is pretty suspicious, considering there's been all this stuff going on with Ukraine. Uh, Russia, of course, has been moving a lot of its military uh, forces, a lot of its troops towards its western border. Uh, kind of prepping for a potential conflict uh, with Ukraine. And Kazakhstan's pretty far away from Ukraine. It's on Russia's southern border. I believe Kazakhstan is Russia's longest border other than their border with China. And so the stability of Kazakhstan is pretty darn important uh, if you're Russia. It's a lot more, it's probably, you know, it's more important potentially uh, than Ukraine. Although I wouldn't go that far, but I mean, it's a bigger border. And so if you've got Kazakhstan on fire across the whole country, that could spread into a pretty wide swath of Russia. And so Russia's priority in this situation, if we see a destabilization of Kazakhstan, as we're seeing right now, um, it's gotten really bad today. Uh, the, I mean, for, for the government's perspective, pretty good from my perspective, because you know, I'm an equal opportunity uh, hater of government regimes there's pretty much yeah, i'll cheer on a revolution against any government um at you know at the time whether it's cia backed or not i do just like to see regimes fall that doesn't mean that what's going to replace the this current regime if the you know uh the color revolution or you know regular revolution i'm not sure i, I don't want to i don't want to say for certainty that i know it's a color revolution but assuming it is um i'm not saying that the regime that they create will be better uh, than the current regime. I just think these guys, every government around the world deserves what's happening to the Kazakh government right now. Government buildings are being sieged. They're being, you know, lit a fire. They're being taken over uh, by citizens. We're seeing people in the streets 
of Kazakhstan handing out weapons, opening up the trunks of their car, arming themselves, uh, capturing uh, military troops who are being sent in to suppress uh, the protesters. And I mean, heck, look at, look at what they're protesting. They're protesting a lifting of price controls. I hate price controls. I'm not a support price controls. Um, yet I'm happy to see people rise up against their government for whatever reason. But uh, this is a pretty important story. Uh, Kazakhstan is the world's largest producer of uranium. So pretty important for nuclear power. Nuclear power, you know, with a little bit of uranium, you make a lot of electricity. So when you see revolutionaries capture uh, the airport in Kazakhstan's largest city, uh, even though I don't think they transport uranium by air, I would think that would be by train, uh, it's a pretty big deal for the global economy. Uh, as I said, Nazarbayev resigned today from his last official position, uh, but that is not enough. People aren't stopping, and that's despite the fact that the internet's been cut off for more than 24 hours now. Uh, there's been no internet since this weekend, and yet we're still seeing a, you know, a trickle of videos out of Kazakhstan. We're hearing live fire uh, from the authorities and uh, I'm sure from the uh, from the protesters by the looks of it. As I said, I, I, you look around Twitter, you can find plenty of videos coming out of Kazakhstan. Or I should say allegedly out of Kazakhstan. You know, we can't confirm them 100% now because it's not like these are Twitter accounts of people in Kazakhstan who are able to post this because the internet shut off there. But we know that the situation is dire because the uh, president of Kazakhstan, I think his name's Tokayev, like Tokarev with a Y instead of a, uh, an R. Um, president Tokayev has requested uh, military assistance from uh, Russia, among other countries. They have their own little NATO over there um, made up of, I think, the caucus uh, nations like Armenia and Kazakhstan and, and Russia and a few others, uh, but mainly Russia. And so getting back to how this would benefit uh, NATO and the United States and why it's suspicious that this Kazakh uprising is happening at this time, as I said, Russia's got all their troops over in the West uh, near Ukraine. If there's an uprising in Kazakhstan and the and Kazakhstan becomes destabilized and needs Russian help to try and impose uh, order, those Russian troops are going to need to leave uh, the western border of Russia and move to the south, a very long way across the country. Uh, I don't know if it's thousands of miles, but it's certainly many, many hundreds of miles, probably thousands of miles, in order to make their way uh, to Kazakhstan. And so this could be the West's way, America's way of saying, oh, okay, you want to, you know, you're so worried about Ukraine, you think Ukraine's going to be a problem for you, we'll give you a real problem to cry about. That's kind of, I think, what, uh, how the, uh, I don't want to say the, the Russian side, because I mean, the Kazakhs and anyone who's just not in favor of the U.S., the U.S., let's just say the NATO skeptical side, that seems to be how they're perceiving what's going on right now. So things are going downhill quite fast uh, for the Kazakh government. I will not be sad to see them go uh, if they in fact do. Uh, reportedly, the revolutionaries uh, attack the airport because they're trying to block Russian troops from being able to fly in. The smart move, that would probably be the airport they fly into um, because planes are what would get them there the fastest. If they have to take trains, uh, the Russian troops, that will take a long time because, as I said, they're hundreds or thousands of miles away uh, in Europe, not even in Asia. Remember, Kazakhstan is in Asia. And so I guess the best case scenario now would be that the Russian troops uh, fly closer to Kazakhstan within Russia and then get on board trains or trucks uh, and drive into Kazakhstan. But that is going to take some time. At the rate things are going, um, the Kazakh government might might indeed fall in that amount of time. At the very least, there might be enough weapons captured and distributed because we've seen uh, that the, uh, the revolutionaries have captured some Kazakh troops. Uh, 
if they capture things, you know, they, whatever the Kazakh equivalent of National Guard armories are uh, in small pockets around the country, uh, the revolutionaries could seize a good bit of territory and weapons and fortify themselves uh, to the point to where you could see a, uh, a Soviet invasion of Afghanistan type of scenario with regard to Kazakhstan if Russia uh, comes in a little late. Right now, the revolution is in its infancy. People are still arming themselves. Uh, it is. It seems to be uh, highly unorganized in the fact that, in the sense that there is no, you know, centralized militia uh, that I know of. Uh, of course, these things we always find out later on are coordinated behind the scenes. Um, you have protest leaders who are all uh, in communication with each other and often in communication with uh, State Department or CIA handlers who are coaching them on how to, uh, you know, whip people up in the most efficient way possible. Again, we don't know that right now, but we may very well find that out later. Again, suspicious timing. So this is a really gripping situation. Um, I will be keeping my eye on it quite closely. Um, this is a much more volatile situation than the, uh, the previous sort of, I guess you could say, uprising uh, that there was in Belarus. Uh, that was not really going anywhere. That was, uh, you know, people out in the streets. It was, it felt much more astroturfed uh, than this. This feels much, you know, hotter and volatile. I think that <clears throat> later on, perhaps the CIA would like to take credit for this because it is um, going so well. Uh, for the anti-government side. I think that when the CIA tries to totally astroturf these re these color revolutions, they're not this successful, which tells me that the there's at least a good bit of a, of a base in Kazakhstan that is uh, amenable um, to the idea of revolting against the government, and that to the extent um, that there is CIA involvement, it's that the CIA is helping uh, you know, willing participants and, you know, perhaps funneling them money and helping them coordinate uh, despite the internet being down, that sort of thing. The CIA could really help in those sorts of cases with logistics when they're trying to um, uh, uh, pull, um, uh, paralyze communications. But there does seem to be too much genuine um, unrest for it to be 100% all these people are paid by the CIA, you know? But heck, I might have to eat those words. You know, if in a week, uh, you know, Nazarbayev uh, is playing golf with Putin in Kazakhstan and everything's fine, um, and there's Russian troops on, you know, standing on every block and people are being obedient and not saying mean things about the government, well, then I'll have to say, okay, I was wrong. I guess that was just CIA propaganda that I was getting fooled into, and there wasn't any uh, real, uh, you know, revolutionary threat. So we'll see. Still too soon to tell. Uh, with that said, I will see you folks back here tomorrow.